From the vast open vistas, to the dunes that march forever on, to the heat that simmers in the horizon, to the icy frigid cold of the polar deserts. Deserts are some of our most amazing environments. They are some of the environments that can create the most testing place for a character in a story. A place where the environment is trying to kill you. But how do you make a desert in a fantasy world? How can you use it in your plot? And why would you? And with what fauna and flora would you populate it? Today, I would like to talk about deserts in fantasy worlds. Welcome to another episode of Just In Time Worlds with your host, Marie Mullaney. If you like this kind of topic and you'd like to support me making more of these, you can check out my Ko-fi page in the description down below where I have membership tiers and one-off donations. Or you can buy my books available on Amazon.com, links to my profile down below in the description. Okay, let's get cracking. First, what is a desert? The most common definition of a desert is that it is a place that sees less than 25 centimeters or 10 inches of rainfall per annum. So very little precipitation, free precipitation falling out of the sky. There are four types of desert and they are generally formed by different factors. The first is your subtropical desert, which is formed between the latitudes of the equator. That's, for example, the Sahara Desert. They are generally your hottest deserts formed here in this tropical zone. Then you have semi-arid deserts. These are deserts like the Karua in South Africa or the Outback in Australia. Now, these deserts are generally formed by a rain shadow. A rain shadow is when you have a mountain range that allows for rain clouds from the one side, generally the eastern side, to hit the mountain range and then precipitate on the eastern side. And then the western side of the mountain range exists in a rain shadow and doesn't get any of those, any of that rain coming over the mountain. Then you get coastal deserts. Coastal deserts are formed when you have a cold current running up the side of the continent. And that cold current doesn't allow for sufficient water to be taken into the air to form clouds which can then fall down as precipitation. An example of this kind of desert is the Namib Desert in Sub-Saharan Africa. And then lastly, you have the polar deserts. And yes, absolutely, you can have Arctic-style deserts. So these are typically deserts where the temperature drops to minus 50 Fahrenheit or minus 45 degrees Celsius, and they have silty, salty, and heavy soils that are known to leach salt. This salt leaching ability makes the oceans that border on the polar desert extremely salty because obviously the salt has been leached out of the soil and ejected into the sea. Due to this high salt content, waters around polar deserts often don't freeze, which is interesting given how extremely cold it is. Antarctica has one of these deserts and it's obviously extremely inhospitable. Today, my focus is primarily going to be on sand deserts. So typically these are coastal deserts or semi-tropical deserts like the Namib or the Sahara Desert. And rather than the semi-arid deserts of say the Karua or the Australian Outback or the polar deserts for that matter. If you'd like me to cover any of those deserts in some detail, let me know in the comments below. And let's crack on and talk about sand. Besides being rough and coarse, getting in anywhere, sand's actually pretty amazing. You can pour sand and it behaves somewhat like a liquid. Sand can be blown by the wind and behave somewhat like a gas. Or it can pack together in dunes and behave like a solid. And that formation of dunes is the first thing we should talk about. Dunes form in ripple effects. The reason why they do that is because what happens is as the wind picks the sand up and the sand starts clumping together in little bundles, generally because they've hit some obstruction or 
there was a gust of wind at the wrong time, a crosswind or whatever, and a couple of clumps formed together. Now these clumps attract other clumps and so the ripple grows. And that's why dunes always have ripples as well and why dunes go as they do in ripples. Now a dune consists out of the slope on the windward side, then the head of the dune, and, there's, and that is at the angle of repose, which is between 30 and 35 degrees. And then you have the slip slope on the other side. The angle of repose is called this because it is the angle at which you can keep the sand stationary before it starts sliding down into an avalanche. If you go over the angle of repose, the sand starts slipping and it slips down the slip slope into the slack between the two dunes. There is a very interesting study, link down below, to a study of Martian dunes. What this study showed is that gravity has no effect on the angle of repose, which is really interesting. If you're building a scientific world, bear in mind that your angle of repose is still likely to be 30 to 35 degrees, even if your world has got a higher or lower form of gravity. Regardless, dunes are actually some of your best fun in the desert. You can go sandboarding on dunes. If you have booming dunes, which is to say dunes that make a sound when sand slips over them, you can make music in the dunes that sounds kind of like a cello. The reason why you can do this is because the dune sands pack together quite tightly and then the loose sands act like a bowstring sliding over them and you get that booming sound that you typically get in the Gobi desert sand dunes in China. Now that could also be a very interesting adaption for your magic if your magic is musically based. You could use something like the dunes to create a sound far larger than what can come out of a human throat or a human instrument. And the size of that sound could potentially power a much larger magical effect. So if you do have a magic system that is based on music, it might be worth considering building a desert with booming sand dunes where mages can go if they want to make spectacular effects that will shake the known world. There is also one other very interesting effect of sand and that is the phenomena of desert roses. Desert roses are formed when water evaporates from a shallow salt basin mixing with the crystal, mixing with a mineral structure there like gypsum or barite. And these crystals form a circular array of flat plates that gives the resulting dried out structure its appearance to being similar to a actual rose structure. Gypsum roses usually have a better defined and sharper edge than barite roses. And they can appear either as a single rose-like bloom or they can appear as a cluster of blooms, typically ranging from pea size to four inches, 10 centimeters in diameter. So you can have these incredible stone structures, this whole rose garden that has grown in places where water has fallen, drained away, and then left behind these stone roses. You can also have these stone roses have mystical or magical significance in your world. Like if you go and find a stone rose and give it to your lover, it means that your marriage will be as strong as rock. Or you could go find a rose like that and grind it up and give it to a sick person and it will cure them of some disease. So there's a lot of mystical and magical elements that you can build into something like the desert roses. Of course, sand also is quite good to the animals who are adapted to the desert and many of them have adapted specifically to work with sand. For example, the side winding motion of snakes is actually a highly efficient moving ability when you apply it across the desert sands. Desert adders also have eyes on the top of their head and they bury themselves in the sand so that only their eyes stick up, which is really unusual evolution for snakes. And this allows them to be these really potent ambush predators. They also have a super venom. They have an incredibly potent venom. And the reason why is because 
when you live in the desert, you can't afford a missed meal. You'll just die. So if they hit a prey animal, they have to kill it. So most creatures that live in the desert have actually evolved this super venom ability. Those who use venom obviously have evolved this super venom ability for that same reason. So when you're building your desert, bear in mind that it might very well have incredibly poisonous animals because they have to kill when they get the opportunity to take prey. Obviously, the snake has to live on something. The Sahara skink is an incredibly cool little lizard that can actually sort of swim through the desert sands. So it looks as though it's swimming on the desert sands and that's what it's evolved to do in order to make its motion fast. This is an ability that I leaned into when I created my desert monster called the Yanari. So the Yanari looks like a blue spotted ray from our world, but it swims through the desert sand and it has eyes on top of its head, allowing it to observe the world around it. It also has an incredibly poisonous sting in its tail based on the super venom that is developed by the snakes of the desert. So you're not just restricted to saying, take a snake or take a skink. You can, as I spoke about in hybridizing animals, combine different animals and different attributes in order to build the kind of desert monster that you would like to see in your deserts. Of course, one of the reasons why animals plunge down into the desert sands is to control the heat. And in fact, some of the adaptions that animals have evolved are truly phenomenal in this respect. There is a desert monitor that has got sensitive cells on the top of its head that actually allow it to measure the temperature around it and warn it to, sh to seek shade when it is growing too hot based on these super sensitive cells on its head. And speaking of detecting things, Scorpions are, of course, one of your most common desert insects, and there are many, many types of them. Scorpions also glow under ultraviolet light. If you didn't know that, that's your factoid for today. And scorpions, and one of the theories around this glow is that scorpions evolved this in order to detect ultraviolet light, allowing them to scuttle for shade. Because when scorpions exited the ocean, all those many, many millions or billions of years ago. I'm not sure how long ago they came out of the ocean, evolutionary speaking. But when they did, ultraviolet light would have been a much bigger concern than it is now. And so they developed this ability to detect it. So it is a vestigial evolutionary effect. And isn't that cool? If you like learning about sand and some of the animals that live in it, hit the thumbs up button. And let's talk about how these animals get water. The most underrated source of water in the desert is fog and dew. There is a beetle in the Namib desert called the darkling beetle that has got grooves on its skin, on its carapace, and the sea that borders the Namib desert sends these fog banks onto land. This fog condensates against the beetle's carapace and then it runs down these ridges and the drops of condensate water is guided down into the beetle's mouth where it drinks. I thought that that was such a cool adaption and that you can use it in your world either magically or physically. So you could have desert people who have a magic that allows fog to condensate against them and runs that condensate water into a container. Or if you want to do it physically, you could have people have runnels tattooed into their skin, right? And then the water condensate could run down those tattoos and perhaps into some string where they can be squeezed into containers from there, which I think would be a fascinating water collection method. There are also rivers in the deserts, but these are generally ephemeral rivers. That is to say rivers that only flow about 25% of the time. So they mostly only flow straight after the rains. The rest of the time, the water collects in deep aquifers that you have to dig down to in order to find them. 
So there are two ways in which ephemeral rivers can, of course, provide water. One is through its plants. You can have water-rich plants grow on the banks of an ephemeral river and have them have their roots go all the way down to the actual water. And then animals can gain that water by eating the leaves and stems of the plants that have, of course, taken the water from the ground. Or you can have animals that are specifically adapted to digging for water or humans who dig for water. So elephants, as an example, can quite adaptly dig for water and desert elephants can provide water for many other animals by digging in ephemeral rivers with their tusks. And then, of course, one has to talk about oases. So oases are where those aquifers that I referred to before, which is basically just underground water, have been exposed to the surface world by, you know, wind taking the sand covering away or an earthquake or some other event that has allowed the water to bubble up to the surface. And so you have water in the middle of the desert. And that's typically where you have your palm tree growth or, or other plant growth and where animals can come to drink water. One of the most gorgeous oases in our world is the Crescent Lake oasis in the Gobi Desert. And what makes it so utterly amazing is you have these sand, you have these dunes around it that are just completely lifeless. And then in the slack between these two dunes, there is this crescent shaped lake and all of this greenery growing around it. As a traveler, as you came over that dune and looked down into the Gobi Desert traveling on the Silk Road, that must have been one of the sites that would bring you such relief in your journey. But oases aren't your only freestanding water in a desert. You also have wadis or rocky pools. Now what happens here is the rain comes down, it gathers in these kind of shady rock pools and it sticks around for a while in these rock pools. And typically here you can even have amphibian life like frogs. So these guys bury themselves in mud while there is water, then the mud dries out when the water finally evaporates and then the frogs basically go into the state of hibernation and the next time there's rain they then you know, come alive again out of the state of hibernation. Now, as I said, these wadis generally form in rock-like formations. And of course, if you have enough rock and you have enough time, canyons can form. Of course, there is the Grand Canyon in the United States, but I personally have not visited that, whereas I have hiked the Fish River Canyon in Namibia. And it was an amazing experience. You're driving over these sand dunes and you arrive at the point where you climb down into the canyon. And once you reach the bottom, there's this flowing river with bushes growing on either side of it and kind of abundant plant, plant life. What I want to highlight from the Fisher Canyon is that you can find mineral springs in a desert. So specifically in the Fish River, you have sulfur springs that are hot. Now, if you've been hiking 20 kilometers a day, carrying your backpack for five days, sleeping in a tent, when you hit those mineral springs, you do not care that it smells of rotten eggs. You just want to get in there. It is worth considering whether you have mineral springs in your world and what mystical significance people attach to them, especially in a desert environment. Think about people coming to a desert environment for healing, coming to bathe in the healing springs of the desert, you know, especially given that they've got to walk through this incredible heat to reach it. It's like a trial that you endure in order to come to the healing springs or a trial that you endure in order to come to the magical springs to unlock your full potential. I think that that would form a very organic kind of endurance test combined with the springs unlocking some sort of potential or healing within the person who's bathing in them. And if you like that discussion of water in the desert, hit the thumbs up button. And let's go a little deeper into plants adapted in, for the desert conditions. There is a plant in the Namib called the Valvitia, at least that's what Europeans call it. The Herero people call it the Onyanga. The Afrikaners call it the two leaves can't die plant. Tweeblaar kan hij do it. 
and it can grow to be millennia old. And it only has two leaves. It doesn't look like it because the leaves are shredded apart by the oryx who graze on it and the other animals who eat from it. But those leaves never stop growing and there are only two of them. And it is one of the hardiest plants in the world, given, of course, where it grows and the length of time it can be alive. There is one Velvicia outside of Swakop Munt that is 1,500 years old, which is just amazing. That kind of plant offers you, the world builder, the opportunity to build in some past magic as well as some plant-based magic. Maybe if you consume the heart of the Onyanga, you can live forever. Maybe if you touch the Onyanga's roots, you will see the past. You know, you can really lean into the fact that this thing can survive for so long and make that a part of your slightly more plant-based magic system. Of course, the Velvetia is not your only plant in desert environments. You also get ephemeral plants. Now, these are quite the opposite. They sprout within three days of getting rained on, and they germinate within 10 to 15 days after that, and then they're dead. So their whole life cycle is less than a month, and they typically flower. So they come, So the rain comes, it sprouts, it germinates, and it's done, just like that. And of course, you could lean into that for your magic system for something like a speed potion or an ingredient to understanding the fleeting nature of life. So those are your two extremes of living long and living short. But there is, of course, other plants in the desert as well. So one of the most interesting things about the Saharan desert is that in the massifs that kind of create little shelter spots, you can still find relic plants. These are plants that come from the time before when the Sahara was not what it is today. And here you will find Mediterranean plants like olive trees and so on living in these sheltered massifs where the climate has not yet completely desertified. So you can have pockets of places that come from a time before desertification that contain the plants of the environment that used to exist before the desert. And then lastly, of course, there are succulents. Succulents are flowering perennial plants and they can have fruits like the prickly pear, which is an amazingly sweet fruit. Most of them don't have leaves. Their leaves have become those sharp spines. And they actually do store up so much moisture that you can despine them and feed the stems to cattle during droughts in order to save the life of the cattle by rehydrating them through eating these plants. The flowers, of course, make them great for ornamental plants. If you're looking for a kind of ornamental plants that your courtiers can keep, you know, and they can have their little rare cactuci and flecks with how pretty the blossoms are, etc., and famously, you can make tequila from it, so you can have booze from cactus. But some cacti are also hallucinogenic. So you can lean into that and have a shamanistic society where the shamans use hallucinogenic cacti in order to reach for the spirit world. You can also then have that lean into your magic system, of course. A mage could eat it and unleash the magic that is stored within the cacti along with the water. So if you, in the, if you enjoyed this discussion of plants in the desert, hit the thumbs up button. And let's talk about fauna. Now, as I already said, water is going to be your big concern here. Besides the darkling beetle with its ridges, a lizard in the Australian outback developed the same kind of technique where it has water that condensates on it and then it guides that water to its mouth. So definitely think about that. The sand grouse can carry water in its feathers. The feathers on its belly specifically are adapted to absorb water and the male sand grouse will go off and find water. It will soak its belly in the water and that will absorb the water into those feathers and then it will take the water back to the nest where its chicks and mate then drink from those feathers. So it's also worth considering what people have 
that let them soak water in this manner, whether it's feathers or some kind of string. Maybe it's a cloth that they weave from a specific plant of the desert, like some sort of fibrous plant that really absorbs water and allows you to carry it over long distances, even without a container. Then, of course, you lose a lot of water through sweating and through peeing. So controlling that can also be a massive evolutionary benefit. The Dorcas gazelle, as an example, can concentrate its urine down to pellets, down to uric acid, and excrete it as these white pellets rather than having any liquid, and thus conserve the actual liquid that would otherwise be lost. Speaking of sweating, cooling down is a big deal. The fennec fox has these huge ears, which are very good for hearing things, but it also has a myriad of blood vessels in it. And those blood vessels exposed to the air allow it to let heat escape into the air and thus cool its body down. The Cape ground squirrel actually uses its tail as a parasol, so it runs around with its tail and makes shade for itself which I think is an adaption that all of us can get behind, like having a squirrel tail that you can use as a parasol would be amazing. So give those ideas some thought when you're building creatures for the desert. Of course, if you are talking about animals in the desert, there is one type of animal that you absolutely have to talk about, and that is the camel. There are two major kinds of camel, the bacterian camel with two humps and the dromedarian camel with one. The hump is not filled with water. I don't know where that thing comes from. It is absolute arrant nonsense. The hump is filled with fat. Yes, the animal can use the fat reserves when there is drought in order to survive, but it is not water, it is fat. <laughs> okay. When the animal uses the fat reserves, the humps go down and can in fact either vanish or kind of flop to the sides. This storage of fat in one place actually allows them to remain cooler as well. It increases their ability to dissipate heat elsewhere because all the fat's concentrated here. So the rest of their body being fat free, they can let the heat escape easier everywhere else. So it's also a heat control mechanism. Camels don't walk on, on their hooves. On each leg, weight is borne on the two large toes that are spread apart to keep the animal from sinking into the sand. So they kind of distribute their weight on their toes. Dromedarians have a soft, wide spreading pad for walking on the sand and bacterian camels have a firmer kind of foot. Like the giraffes, they pace. So they move these two legs, then these two legs, then these two legs, then these two legs. That's their gait. In severe heat, a camel can survive for four to seven days without drinking but it can go for up to 10 months without drinking at all if it is not working and the plants that it forages contains enough moisture. So remember when I said about ephemeral rivers, if a camel can graze from plants around an ephemeral river, it can go for up to 10 months without taking a single sip of water. That is some leet water adaption. Even salty water can be tolerated by a camel if it's not too salty. So a camel is super adapted for water management. Like the Dorcas gazelle, the camel can reduce its urine liquid down to one fifth of its normal level of liquid and excrete more or less pure uric acid. Not quite to the extent the gazelle can, but still pretty impressive water management. It can also produce feces dry enough for camel herders to make fire with. So it can squeeze the liquid out of its feces as well and provide a means for its human companions to make fire with. It's covered in a fine woolly coat that also reduces the heat gain. And it can allow its body temperature to rise up to 41 degrees Celsius before it starts sweating. This animal is amazing and it can form a central part of your desert culture. It can be a source of food, it can be a, it can be a mount, it can be something that they race with as per the camel races of our world. Camels to a desert environment can be a true blessing if you want to lean into them and create yourself some camels for your world. And if you like the discussion of desert animals, hit the thumbs up button and let's briefly touch on some more desert magic. So first, 
if your magic is kind of based on energy, you could draw from the heat of the desert. So you could have mages who go to the desert and draw from the heat and then use that to make magic. Or you could have mages create deserts because they draw on life. And by drawing on life, they basically take the life out of the soil and thus they encourage desertification. So the more mages cast, the less the life on your planet and the larger the amount of desertification, which I think would be an interesting downside to magic. And I wonder whether mages would be severely restricted by most nations if this was something that they did. Of course, in a desert, certain kinds of magic would be incredibly useful. Cooling magic, shade magic, magic that creates water. All of these would be unbelievably useful. And naturally, you can also use deserts to kind of have these vision quests idea. Places you go to in order to be tested. Places that you go to in order to see the future or the past or connect yourself with the spirit world. But what do you think? How would you apply deserts and magic in a fantasy world? Let me know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, hit the thumbs up button and maybe check out my video on extreme cold conditions. If you want to connect with me and other world builders on topics like this, I do have a Discord server, link in the description, and I will see you soon for another episode of Just In Time Worlds.